is the South's oldest independent feminist pursuit. Thank you. We're really honored always and always excited to be in the House of all Academy Research Library on African American culture and history. AARL is one of our oldest and strongest partners, and so there's no other places we want to speak to. It. When I was thinking about Dr. Bettina Love's book, I was thinking about books that reminded me of this work. And in some ways, of course, this work is singular. But I thought about academic books that could change culture. And the first person I thought of was Dr. Carol Anderson and her book, White Rage. I remember reading the early galley of that book before it came out and thinking, this is the rare book that might actually change how some people act <laughs> and how some people think. And so one of the great joys of being a bookseller and a programming person is that I get to help match make the conversation that I want to hear. And so this is a conversation that I want to hear um, between two amazing thinkers of our time who we are fortunate enough to have here in our city with us. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Carol Anderson first. She is the Charles Howard Handler Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Emory University. She is the author of One Person No Vote, which was long listed for the National Book Award and a finalist for the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award. White Rage, a New York Times bestseller and winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award, Bourgeois Radicals, and I of the Prize, and a contributor to the 1619 Project. She was named a Guggenheim Fellow for Constitutional Studies and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and her newest book is The Second, Race and Gun in a Fatally Unequal America, which is available in a lot of universities. The person of the hour is Dr. Bettina Alvaro. I know just anecdotally, some of y'all have come in very little to meet Dr. Bettina Um, And that's, that's because Dr. Love's work is, again, singular in its accessibility, its brilliance, and she is singular in her magnetism and her desire to draw people to transformative ideas. Dr. Love is the William F. Russell Professor at Teachers College of Columbia University and the best-selling author of We Wanted to More Than Survive. In 2022, the Kennedy Center named Dr. Love one of the next 50 leaders, making the world more inspired, inclusive, and compassionate. A co-founder of the Abolitionist Teaching Network, which you can learn more about, whose mission is to develop, develop and support teachers and parents fighting injustice within their schools and communities. They have granted over $250,000 to abolitionists around the country. She is also a founding member of the task force that launched the program in her hands, distributing more than $15 million to Black women living in Georgia. In her hands is one of the largest guaranteed income pilot programs in the U.S. Dr. Love is a sought-after public speaker on a range of topics, including abolitionist teaching, anti-racism, hip-hop education, Black girlhood, queer youth, educational reparations, and art-based education to foster youth. Civic engagement. In 2018, she was granted a resolution by Georgia's House of Representatives for her impact on the field of education. And the book we're here celebrating tonight, published Punished for Dreaming How School Reform Harms Black Children in Cowley Hill, published on September 12th. And it is already on the New York Times. <laughs> I love it. Give her her flowers now. <laughs> This book is powerful. It is a love song to Black children and Black parents. And when I was reading it, I felt Roberta Flack <laughs> killing me softly. Ooh. Ooh. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about this incredible work that you did. <laughs> what led you to write it? Um, 
Well, first, thank y'all for being here. Uh, it's really wonderful to see so many of my friends and family here. Um, before I get started, let me just say, this book is not possible without your work. The very first chapter, you know, is Educational White Rage. Mm -hmm. When I read White Rage for the very first time, I said, oh, this is the answer. She, she, yeah. she put it down like, this is how we have to frame, this is how we have to think about it. I think it's one of the most consequential books when we try to get understanding of race and how it shaped and how it formed in our society. So thank you. I could not have written this book without White Rage. And that was one of the things that really pushed me. But I would say that I've been trying to write this book since I was 17 years old. And so anybody knows me, I'm from Rochester, New York. I take that serious being from the rock. <laughs> and I went to a really big high school in Rochester, New York. It was so big, we had an airplane inside the school. And there was, my freshman class was about 600, 700 students in my freshman class. We were 14, we thought we knew everything, and we were ready to go. And I was a ball player. Four years later, of those 600, 700 kids, only 180 graduated. And I'm being generous. And I remember walking across the stage in a huge auditorium saying to myself, where is everybody? Where is everybody? Where did, all, where did all my friends go? Where did all, what happened to everyone? So if, I don't think it's odd that I become a teacher. I started to study reform. I wanted answers about where did all of these kids go? Look like me, walk like me, talk like me. Where were we? And so I've always been curious about what happened to my generation, young folk of my generation, young folk with the zip code of mine, talk like me, walk like me, black. I wanted to understand what happened to us, particularly 80s and 90s. Oh. Tell me, tell me stop. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. When we started off with Duke, mm. Mm. we all know her. We all have her in our lives. What led you to, to, to weave the powerful stories through here? You've got strong, strong, powerful scholarship. And your work on the policy, because we're going to get to the policies. <laughs> but the, the stories, yeah. that's what grips you. Yeah. What led you to those stories? So first, I think when we talk about reform, we just talk about it as data, or we talk about it as this policy, no child left behind, or race to the top, or goals 2000. We don't talk about it as real people. It impacted real people's lives. And so I wanted to bring the stories of people that I knew and how they were impacted by reform. And so I had to start with Zook. Zook is one of my dearest, closest friends. Uh, Zook will probably be here today, but her wife is being inducted to the uh, Hall of Fame. So she is celebrating right now. But Zook became my cautionary tip. So I'm 14 years old, and I think I'm a basketball star. You can't tell me anything. And you can't tell Zook anything either. So it's truly love and basketball. I'm 14, I want to take her spot. They don't let me take her spot. So we're going back and forth. Now, by the end of basketball season, there's a scandal that breaks out at my high school. The scandal is that Zoom and some other male players were not going to class, allegedly. And we were 22 and 1, and they took all our games away. So by the end of the season, we're pretty much out of the playoffs. Season is over. And at Zook's disciplinary hearing, they start telling her all the things she did not do, all the assignments she didn't do, and Zook knocks out of teaching. And so you hear over the intercom in our high school, Van Hoops on the loop, Van Hoops on the loop. We like, what did we do? <laughs> but if you pull back the layers, you start to see a kid who's in trauma. You start to see a kid who doesn't know where their parents are, and you start to realize that this same young woman at the age of 12 was assaulted by her teacher, physically assaulted. So that blow that she threw, that wasn't just a blow for that teacher. That was a blow for everybody. And Zook would tell me, you know, see the knees get the grief. And Zook said, I don't know child, I don't know child left behind before no child left was left behind. And so I've always, she's been my cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. And so once this happened to Zook, and I saw how, no matter how good a basketball player you are, no matter how many jokes you can tell, if they're going to dispose of you, they're going to dispose of you. And I saw them dispose of my friend, my best friend. 
And from there, it became a cautionary tale about how even playing a basketball, even being a basketball star, they were disposed of you. And she was a child and she made a mistake. And then after that, her life was pretty much over until she gets to an HBC and is able to turn her life around. And so I'm always just trying to tell the story of the folks who meant so much to me and how I saw them punished for just being Black and being a Black kid and dealing with what they created for us. Thank you. Can you risk us through how foundational the narrative of Black pathology is? Yeah. That there is something wrong with Black people yeah. that needs to be fixed. Yeah. And not something wrong with the system uh -huh. that has done all of this damage. Yeah. Can you help us understand what that looks like in the school system? That's a great question. So there's a book by Lindsay Stewart, and she's kind of riffing off of the work of Zora Neale Hurston. And she says this, and this is one of my favorite quotes, and I keep it with me. She said that white people believe that without their intervention, our lives are terrible. <laughs> and I just hold that. Like they honestly truly believe that without their intervention, that our lives are destitute. And when you think about that and you hold that, that is what reform is. It's the very idea that without them, our lives are meaningless. Our lives are always in peril. And we need them. And they believe that we need them. And so in education reform, no matter what decade, you begin to see how the very idea of their interventions. And so what they begin to do is create a crisis. Mm -hmm. Then they want to be in charge of facing the crisis. Yeah. 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 And then when their low level, low budget, uninformed ideas don't work, then now we are the ones who fail. Mm -hmm. And you see that time and time again for the last 60 years since we integrated school, the very idea that they will create a crisis. And so education reform for me, and really any type, we can put welfare reform, immigration reform, any type of reform, it's the idea that we need white intervention. And without white intervention, we don't know what to do. Our lives are in chaos. And so I always keep that quote when I think about what kind of schooling intervention we get. So you mean like the way that slavery actually benefited the enslaved? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Always needing to feel like without them, we have we have no say. We have no understanding. And that narrative of black pathology mm -hmm. does the damage to our children. Oh yeah. So let's talk. We're going to walk through some of these reforms. And then we're going to walk to how we heal. Okay. Brown. Mm. So, man, Brown does a doozy on us. <laughs> but I think it's important that we understand who we were and what we had before Brown. Because it's very clear, you know, the always talks about this in Reconstruction. White folks had no intention of educating their children for the this out. They had no intention. Black folks, newly freed Black folks said, the first thing we're going to do is create schools and churches mm -hmm. and institutions to teach teachers how to teach. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. Newly free, we saved our money and the freedom of faith. We were about the idea that education was liberation. And so we had, not only did we have teachers, we had extraordinary teachers. Teachers who were highly credentialed. So now I'm talking about Lindsay Farnsworth, who out of Harvard University, where she talks about these Black teachers were highly credentialed. Not only were they highly credentialed, they were working pretty much seven days a week. So teaching five days a week, doing all types of bake sales and cookie sales and all types of things to raise money on Saturday. And Sunday, how many churches did you know they went to? They were the backbone of the community. We talked about almost 90,000 teachers teaching 2 million children. Mm. Highly skilled, highly credentialed. And we know as Minnesota Walker will tell us, to their highest potential. To their highest potential. To their highest potential. So this is what we have. Then we have this Brown versus Board of Education. And let's be very clear. Black folks at the time were telling the NAACP and Third Marshall, Marshall, hey, don't do this. Please don't do this. It's not going to work. But we also have to understand that Brown wasn't just about integrating schools. Brown was about the United States of America saying to the world, hey, we're not as racist as you think. 
Because you had countries like Russia who were saying, how do you tell them what to do? Look like you're calling black people without the show here of black people. But Russia was saying, you can't tell us what to do. Look how you treat your own people. And so Brown becomes unanimous. You even hear the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall talk about world propaganda and how we have to understand this is the world looking at us. So they're using this idea that we have to integrate schools to show the world that we are not as racist or as bad as you think we are. So that's why the Brown decision is unanimous. But like always, and you talk about this in white rage, is that when black folks fight, when black folks protest, when black folks actually do the work of democracy, we are pushed. And so here we go, we integrate schools. Now, what we were asking for is not really the integration of schools, what we wanted was our money. Because black folks were actually paying double at the time. We were paying taxes and we were paying for our own schools. So we were paying double at the time, and our teachers were making this. And so we were fighting for the idea of our money, not necessarily integrating schools. But after Brown, what happens? We see the gutting of black education. In the 17 states that were segregated in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, black teachers made upwards of 50% of all teachers. 50% of the teaching population after Brown were gutted. The last 40 years, black teachers have not made up less than 10% of teachers. Black males make less than 2% and black women 6 to 8%. We saw anywhere from 38 to 40,000 teachers gone after Brown. 90% of principals gone after Brown. The curriculum, the relationships gone after Brown. Black education was essentially gutted. But they only, they only they did not only just gut black education, they took their property tax with them. The suburbs were a thing, but not really a thing. They proliferated the suburbs and they built segregation academies, their own private schools, and got subsidies from the federal government to do it. And so then you look and say, well, look at this city school. You got it. You took the money from it. And then got the next uh, achievement gap. The gap and they got the audacity to tell us that we're not achieving. Well, people are the same thing that you are. And so we see how becomes the emphasis for the gutting of black education in this country. And what we had, we could never get back. Right, because one of the key elements in there was that black teachers, and you make this so clear, as does Vanessa Little Walker, mm -hmm. um, black teachers really believed in black children. That's right. Really believed in the achievement. Black children could fly. That's right. And and that kind of belief that you can fly just gives you wings. Like I mean, you just soar. And then once you once black teachers are removed from black children, and once they're put in a hostile environment, where they're told you're not college material. That's right. You can never achieve. You can never succeed. Why don't you know? what you know your place mm -hmm. the damage that that does so when you're asking what happened to all of those folks that i went to school with in rochester yeah. your book really lays out what happened to those kids yeah. it was the incredible toxicity yeah. raining down on them the disbelief in their abilities that's right and if you don't have a parent behind you somewhere, or if you're not, as my mother would say, hard head, <laughs> then all of that coming from an adult does damage. It, it is corrosive. That's right. Brown. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think, you know, I talk about in the book, is that, you know, brown spirit murdered us. Hmm. What you're talking about is your spirit being murdered. Mm -hmm. The very idea that I am a child. And I don't need to be seen as a child. I'm a black child. And you're stripping me of my culture. You're stripping me of my identity. You're stripping me of my cultural DNA. How I want to present myself. How I want to come to school. When I see myself as beautiful. And then you're questioning all of that. And so we talk about death a lot as black folk. But what we don't talk about is the psychological death mm -hmm. of racism. Mm -hmm. And how the spirit murders us. Yes. When you doubt yourself. When you shrink yourself. When you walk into a room and you don't see yourself. Right, you don't see anything that looks like you, talks like you, walk like you. So you begin to think and question yourself. You are murdering our baby spirits. It's a slow death, but it's a methodical death, and it's an intentional death. And I think we all have witnessed it uh -huh. being in these schools. That's what's so powerful about this book. When I say "killing me softly," oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> 
a nation at risk. Yeah. yeah. I remember the Bill Bennett thing when it came out. Mm -hmm. Help us understand the nation at risk. So, you know, a nation at risk is probably one of the most consequential education reports probably in the last 50, 60 years. But a nation at risk, you have to understand, is how you create a crisis. And so we'll back up just a little bit. 1979, 1978, you have the right. Now, you really don't have a right in this country until Brown. Brown is when white folks get organized. They are bad time, upset, mad, but they are not organized. Yes, they got a Ku Klux Klan, but they begin to build all types of foundations and nonprofits and think tanks after Brown was the Board of Education. They believe that Brown goes too far. The very idea that the federal government can tell me that my little white child has to sit next to a, a black child is going too far. And so they begin to create the John Burke Society, right? They begin to get organized. So by the 1980s, when Reagan take office, they are a full-fledged machine. They got big tanks, they got nonprofits, they got foundations, and they are ready to go. It takes them about 20, 25 years, but by 1980, they're ready to go. So the late 1970s, they got a report that they're saying how badly public education is. They want to undo this thing that Brown did. And so they start to proliferate the idea that public education is failing. Now, that's 19, late 1970s. By 1980, 81, they get their boy, which is Ron O'Reilly. They get they, they get they won. Now, 1982, Ronald Reagan does what? Declare a war on black people. The very idea of war on drugs is just a war on black people. And we know that. We got documentary after documentary, three reports. They have, we know all the lies, but we know what a war on drugs was. 1983 is a nation at risk. Now, in 1983, take that report, that data, that misleading data, all those lies, the report from the late 1970s. And they all put it in a nation at risk, which says that this country education system is failing so badly from other Western nations that it could call a war. That's not bad for family. Now, there's data at the time that says our schools are actually doing okay. And then there's other data at the time that says our schools are doing great. They don't use that data. They already had the data from the late 70s. So 1982, Reagan declares a war on drugs. 1983, you have a nation at risk. And in 1983, you have the DARE program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the DARE program? The DARE program says, listen, there's some good people, there's some bad people, bad folks, they got to go. And we'll give you a t-shirt if you snitch on your parents. You want a PJ? Now remember a little snitch box. Like a t-shirt now, who creates the DARE program? Is it Daryl Gates? Who is Daryl Gates? He is actually the police chief during the Rodney King execution. He's actually the same police chief that said Black folks have different esophagus, so it's okay to put us in the job. That becomes the individual who puts the DARE program in all the schools across the country. Now, the DARE program has had federal funding for almost the last 40 years. And we have research that says that their program, if you complete it, you actually have a higher risk of doing drugs than not doing drugs. <laughs> has their funding stopped? No, it has not. <laughs> and by 1984, Reagan released another report called Chaos in the Classroom. Again, using data from 1970 that these kids are out of line, they're out of order, and we have to put police in schools. So you see, just through that timeline, four years from the world drug a nation at risk, their chaos in the classroom, how they are manufacturing a crisis. But what they are doing is putting a multi-pronged assault on black life. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a war on drugs now. Now we're going to go to education. Now we're going to defund public education. They are saying, this is revenge. You all had the audacity, the courage to integrate schools? This is revenge. And so what we're seeing right now in 2023 is revenge season. But understand that Brown was the engine that struck that match to where we are in 2023 with both like the same. It's been a long game since Brown versus the Board of Education. And we're watching it over and over again. But if you can track these policies and how they have used fake, false, misleading information to create a crisis in education and then use that crisis against us. But it's always about the idea that if you can convince people that the public good is not working, 
then you can convince them to privatize. Mm -hmm. But you got to sow the seed first that the public good or this public entity is no longer serving the public. And that's what we're watching right now. Okay. <laughs> That's just a land because you were just cool right there. <laughs> no. <laughs> no child left behind. So, you know, what I try to do with the book is I can ask the Bush brothers. <laughs> um, Bush boys. Because even though Joe doesn't get to be the president, he is doing real damage down in Florida, too. We got to be very clear about that. But what we want to first say in that first No Child Left Behind is solely from a black woman. Those are not his words. So he takes the words of a black woman and then he says, we're going to undo this thing of race. And it becomes one of the most punitive education reform models we have ever seen and still living with right now. Because what it says, and I think at the core, No Child Left Behind does sound good, is that we want to make sure all students are achieving. And so we're going to test, test, test. We're going to break them up by race and see how they're achieving. Nobody will. Okay, we understand that. But what you're not going to do is be punitive. What you're not going to do is look at a system that is underfunded, where Black students who need the most get the least. You have gutted Black education. And on top of that, students who need the most get the least experienced teachers in this system. Also, with 25, 35 students in a classroom. And now you're going to sit here and say that you're going to leave no, no child behind. You already left them behind. No child. With no money and no, and no teachers. And then got the audacity to be punitive when they don't reach the standards that you put. So that is no child left behind. I'm trying to see foreclosures, a proliferation of charter schools, and then also the idea that students could be held back, it becomes very punitive, and it changes the course of many children's lives through this idea of leaving no child behind. And I would argue that it left so many children behind. So I think about one of the elements of that, which was to allow students who were in failing schools to be able to go to schools that weren't failing. Mm -hmm. When I lived in Missouri, what that meant, though, was that the schools that weren't failing said, we have no room at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so those children in failing schools didn't get additional resources. In fact, the policy removed resources from those schools and gave that money to the schools that weren't failing. Lord, does that make sense? Yeah. Because when your policy is about undermining public education, That's right. This is how this works. That's right. I feel like TLC right now, right? This is but you go back to a nation at risk. If you really felt that this country was failing to that extreme, fund education. If you really feel like that is happening, well, hire teachers, pay them a living wage. You know, one in five teachers in this country has to moonlight. You have schools in this country that don't have drinking water. You have schools in this country where the AC, vent, AC vents are so terrible that it's causing learning disabilities in students. So you're going to tell me there's an achievement gap, but the air I'm breathing is causing the learning disability in my own body, but now you're going to penalize me for the achievement gap. Oh. This is what they're doing. But again, to your point, if the goal is to underfund and undermine democracy and public education, then follow the money. Follow the policy. Right. And so one, one of the key elements in that was the Rodriguez decision, mm -hmm. um, which came in 1972 or so, 72, 74. I'm a historian bad with <laughs> And what that policy did, because they already had the Milliken decision, which said you got it. Got it. You could not use the suburbs in order to desegregate the city, but you had massive white flight out of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Massive, I mean, massive white flight out there. And then you had the next decision that dealt with funding of public schools because the funding is based on property taxes. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know because of a series of policies where Black folk live, the property values aren't as high. Mm -hmm. 
In San Antonio, they were taxing themselves at the highest level allowed by law and only generating like $21 per student. The rich suburb mm -hmm. was taxing itself at a much lower level and was generating hundreds of dollars per student. So you begin to think about what you can do on $21, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. you can do with like 300 and some dollars. Right. It's really, there's a, and so that case goes up to the US Supreme Court arguing that you don't have equal protection under the law because of the way the schools are funded. Mm -hmm. The US Supreme Court said you do not need equal funding to have equality of education. So I think it's important to talk about the courts. So after Brown, unanimous decision, Thurgood Marshall, rightfully so, gets on the court. Now, this Detroit case that you're talking about, which happens about 20, 25 years after Brown. There's a change of the court. Guess what president gets four Supreme Court justices? Mm -hmm. Nixon. Nixon gets to put, before he is disgraced and has to leave, gets a small in the back, set down, sir. He puts four US justices on the Supreme Court. And before Thurgood Marshall's eyes, he's sitting on the court where they got Brown through that Detroit case. Thurgood Marshall is sitting on the court when that happens. And so it is, you know, the courts love us some days and other days they act like they don't even know us. <laughs> but it is through these cases over and over again that we start to see the gutting, but also be clear, we just saw the gutting of affirmative action. Oh. And this is how it's done. You do it through the courts. You have presidents who select, their nominees, you move them through, and they have been so methodical. They have been so steady. And you are now seeing gutting of affirmative action, women's rights, gay rights. What we have worked for over the last 60 years, you are seeing the gutting, and they want you to believe it's coming out of nowhere. They want you to believe it's just, it's just rising up, right? It is methodical, it is a plan, and they are truly well-funded truly well-funded. And so we're watching this, and if we're going to fight back, we got to get well-funded, and we got to get organized. Yes. Because the uh, Washington Post did this amazing, and they just ran another story this weekend, around 60% of all book bans are submitted by 10 people. 60% <laughs> of all book bans, you can go to the Washington Post right now, May 23rd, 2023, they ran this incredible examination of the book bans, particularly book bans on LGBTQ. And they found that it was submitted by 10 people. This weekend, they just ran another piece of the one white lady in Virginia who is says she will submit one a week for the rest of her life. One a week. She got the time. This is what we're up against. But we have let policy be able to do that. And so this is where white rage comes in. In your book, White Rage, you say it plainly, is that when you are able to legislate your racism, when you are able to make book bans and policies and reforms that legislate your racism, and this is what we are watching, the way in which they can legislate they hate for us, they can legislate anti-blackness. But you also say in your book, that you will see white rage when you see black excellence. Yes. Yes. It's not a mere of black people It is blackness of ambition, blackness of drive, and blackness that the race for the full demands of citizenship. It is blackness that refuses education. We'll see all the time. Damn. Every time. <laughs> That's the quote. That's the quote. Well, you see my rights because we know what we're supposed to do. And we refuse to get to the I say we need to organize, we strategize, we march the protest, we keep going. Ah, we don't stop. We're going to put the phone tag. We strategize, we march, we keep going. 
Okay, we're going to see that. We organize. We strategize. We march. We keep going. On the right, D-Law, Georgia, we organize. We strategize. We march, and we keep going. Right? When you see us, you have to know that white rage is around the corner because we're not going to stop. That's it. We're not going to stop. <laughs> Mom, I love your book. <laughs> Likewise. Likewise. The anti war law as a reform. Walk us through that. So, again, you are manufacturing a crisis. Mm -hmm. This playbook is not new. Mm -hmm. So let's just take some raw numbers with this anti war Let's just take raw numbers, okay? Now let's just imagine that anti war is actually happening. I don't know what that means, but let's say it's happening, right? Because they still say vote black. We didn't say vote. Like, yo, we're not getting to that Now, let's say vote is actually happening. Let's just, let's just let's go down this rabbit hole with them. Who's doing it? Right. Percent of teachers in this country. How much? Right? I know. So, you know, so, you know, so, you know, so, in the last two years, not just in Florida, all around the country, everybody had their conference in Philly. And Philly showed out too. Yes, got them right on out. <laughs> but if you think about the magnitude of the way they are using white rage, the way are they are having all of these laws and all these book bans and all of these legislation, then you would have to say, where are the examples? Where are the people doing it? Where's the curriculum? And if 88% of all teachers are white women, then this is the population who must be doing the work. This that's how you know it's, it's trash. Because they don't even have the numbers, the people to justify it. And so this is why we have to be having these conversations and calling them to the table and asking them not just to give us more political, you know, talking points, but actually data. And this is what's funny about it. They're always talking about data. We need data. Where's the curriculum? Where are people doing it? No show. But you want data. We tell you right now, we got data that says only 2% of teachers are black male. You don't care about that. We got data right now that says teachers are underpaid. You don't care about that. So it's not about data. It's about spinning a narrative that perpetuates what they want. And that is the erosion of public education. Come on. Yes. Christopher Ruto. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, need, we need a smudge pot in here. <laughs> Christopher Rufo is one of the right wing folk who developed the, the you know the anti critical race theory mm -hmm. attack, and he was really clear about it. He was public about it. Mm -hmm. We're going to label anything critical race theory. Yes, folks don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but it's got the word critical mm -hmm. and race. <laughs> so folks know they're not going to like it. And we're going to brand everything CRT, that's right? Um, and and we're going to get white folk riled up mm -hmm. about this that their kids are being indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. I remember having a conversation with parents, white parents, who who had been at a school board meeting, going, "I don't want my child indoctrinated." And I said, mm -hmm. "If your baby is studying critical race theory and is in kindergarten, <laughs> get your baby in Mensa." <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Because this is law school. Yeah. This is what they teach in law school. And, that, and not in all law schools. Mm -hmm. But here you see that kind of deliberate crafting of the crisis. Mm -hmm. Our public schools are indoctrinating our children. And so we need to divert public funding to these charter schools in order so that our children can get a real education. All right. Let's talk about Betsy DeVos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All her name. It's like saying Beetlejuice, juice, but don't say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> hey, I love it. I'm here for it. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's important to talk about her family because she is one of the many, many philanthropists, uh, crusaders, they will call themselves, uh, reformers, who truly believe, again, that we need white intervention. And so the DeVos family, particularly out of Michigan, have been funding the ideas of charter schools for the last 20 years. Now, again, what they have done in Michigan is that they have used their money and their influence to ensure that charter schools go unchecked, unregulated, and that you can be someone where your charter school should be closed down and they create a loophole so you can still create a charter school that should be closed down. That's what they've been able to do. They find their own politicians, they find their own people, and they school boards, right? So they've really been an integral family doing this work. Now we think about the boss as Secretary of Education, but if you just see her in that light, it's not really them. Their family and what they have done in Michigan and charter schools around the country. Now I want to be very clear to charter school folks in the room. I'm not someone who's anti-charter, but I do think we have to deeply understand how charter schools rest in the portfolio of, of reformers. And so we don't talk about that enough. Now, yes, there's some good charter schools. There's also some really great public schools. But what you don't understand is that almost every millionaire, billionaire, hedge fund manager, they have invested in charter schools. They call themselves educational entrepreneurs. They call themselves you know, venture capitalists. And they invest their money into charter schools. They make money by investing in charter schools. They get tax breaks by investing in charter schools. And so even though charter schools, and there's some really great people who do charter school work, I know some my family, I know people who work in charter schools, but I think we have to talk about the larger understanding of charter schools rest as part of the campaign to publicize, to depublicize public education. Mm -hmm. And it's part of that. And we've got to be able to talk about that openly and not just demonize public school, I mean, charter school, but to understand where they set in the larger you know, taking of public dollars and public good and public trust. And, you know, one of the best examples I can give is the kid story. So, you know, <laughs> there is a black woman in Houston, Texas by the name of Harriet Law. Yes. <laughs> now, she can sing, she can rap, she can play the piano, she can write music, you name it, she can do it, baby. And she's winning teacher of the year time and time again. Now, there's two white boys from Teach for America. Again, this idea that you know you can be a teacher with six weeks of training. Yeah. With who children are children and what are women. You don't see that anywhere else. So these two white boys who are struggling in the classroom, really struggling, they say, Miss Paul, can you help us? She says, Yes, but it's a good southern black Christian lady. Yes, baby. Sit at my feet. They sit at her feet for two years. They learn her songs. They learn her chants. They learn everything that she can do. And after those two years, they go off to get funding and create kids. Knowledge is power. Now, what is Miss Paul's most famous song? Knowledge is power. You got to read, baby. You got to read. You got to get that knowledge. You got to get that power. In 2011, Miss Paul dies trying to open up her own school when they have over 200 students. There is not one school in her name. Oof. And I was very fortunate enough that my amazing doc student in the back found her children for me. And I was able to tell her to <laughs> And so the question that her children want to ask is how everybody else's family eating and her and their children are not. Right. How are her grandchildren not eating and her songs and her methods are being used. And so the question has to be made, what is reparation? What is old? The Harry Ball, what is all these black women who have created these schools, worked in these schools, played for these schools, and they got nothing in return? She died in 2011 in very bad shape. She's struggling, she has a cane. And the story goes that Ms. Ball says, Hey, listen, I want to be a part of this. And they said, You can be a teacher. And on top of that, you know, this is the late, you know, and around 1990, late 2000, like Miss Ball, well, Kip goes on 
Oprah Winfrey show. Yeah. Now, you know, as a black woman, there's nothing important, nothing more important than that time period. <laughs> Guess who goes on the Oprah Winfrey show? Sits on the couch. David Mike. Mm -hmm. Where's this ball? At home. Room. She sees a video of herself in the background while these two talk like they created kids and they are, you know, engineering this whole idea of reforming education. And so it's stories like that in the book that really motivated me to write, motivated me to keep going. Um, I was lucky enough to be a student at Georgia State. And I first learned about Ms. Ball and Asa Hillis. And so, you know, Asa would go, he would go around the country and he would find these amazing teachers. He would videotape them. He, I, he probably pulled out like a VHS, like, listen, listen, watch this lady. And I saw her for the first time. She was rapping, singing, and the kids were just going. And I've always been curious about her and I've always wanted to tell her story. And so I'm just really fortunate that her children allowed me to tell her story, but to also frame it through education reform. And these ideas are reformers. I remember being in the pandemic like you all sitting in my house, don't know what's going to happen, don't know, I don't, do I got the cookies? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> and I remember watching Bill Gates. I said, where's Fauci? Why are you on the TV? Who are you? But we, we live in a culture now where if you are a billionaire, billionaire, you get to inform policy. With no understanding, no expertise, and pretty much always about black and brown children. I was on Twitter yesterday, and Elon Musk was at the border. Right. He was at the border. And again, he stayed at a Holiday Inn. He was the people. He was the people. <laughs> so again, no training, no expertise, nothing. Ready to inform us. And we have to ask people out of our business. Get out of our business. Don't know what you're doing, and you're wasting billions of dollars with unproven, unfound experiments on who always black folk and children of color. They are experimenting on us, and we got to ask them to get out. We, you actually you know what? Keep your money. So here's we've been talking about how, how messed up stuff is. <laughs> you notice I said messed up. I was really good there. <laughs> <laughs> How do we get free? Mm -hmm. That's what we've been asking since 1619. How do we get free? You know, I've really thought about that a lot. I think when you have education books that really critique and lay out the issues, then the solution is like, it's liberation, y'all. Like, what does that mean? And so I was very fortunate enough to be able to work with a group of economists and policy and all black women. And for almost a year, we met over Zoom. And we came up with what we thought were some categories around harm. And I think it's very, I think we have to be clear first about, we're gonna think about how do we get free? How do we think about liberation? We have to think about the language that we use. Mm -hmm. So what we've been describing for the last 45 minutes is not just policy. It's not just inequality, it is harm. And if we're gonna see it as harm, then there has to be repair. And so the vocabulary and the words that we use are critical. You know, I think about what they're calling us at risk. Uh -huh. Who at risk? Right. Only the risk is your own. In my community, you are fortunate. That's the risk. Or when we call, you know, we are underprivileged children. Who are or, you know, this is a first generation college student. I'm the first generation college student. I'm the first group you let in. We got to be clear about the language. This is harmful. They are doing harm. And so the other word for repair is reparations. And we have to be thinking very clearly that if you're going to harm us systematically, fundamentally, then we have to say this is what repair would look like. And so I was able to work with these economists to think about what would education reparations would be? And I think too often in society, when we think about reparations, we think about, okay, you were denied a home loan because you were black. You were denied a business loan because you were black. Your home or your uh, business was devalued because you were black. 
mass incarceration, what Eric Meyer would call targeted mass incarceration, because it wasn't mass. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, also police brutality. Like these are the levels for reparations in this country. And we have states like California right now who are hopefully taking a very critical look at reparations. But I would argue that before you deny the home loan, before you deny the business loan, you are black and you are educated in American schools. Right. And that education that is inherently inferior, that they know is inferior. And it's not a gap, like you talked about. It's not a gap. Like we have a funding gap. We have a funding gap. A funding gap means we missing each other. A funding gap means we need a beat and then we're going, we're going to get things further away. The way we fund schools in this country systematically ensure my demise. So it's not a gap. So we know it's harder. We see it at harm. We have to start fighting for DEI. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't have diversity, equity, inclusion with no money. No a staff of one, a staff of one training one, and then you have one person who's supposed to be a savant in everything. Uh huh. Especially so trans, especially so racist, especially that. Like we have to have actual solutions that put us on the offense. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's to think about reparations within the field of education. And so these amazing black women, one weekend came to my house. My beautiful wife was cooking nonstop. And they started doing some type of hidden figure type stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know what she's trying to do. Look like a lot of men. And they started calculating. And they started saying, oh, we can start to calculate them. So I'll give you a few examples. In 2010, there are almost 100,000 Black students who qualify for AP, had a test score for AP, but were not enrolled in AP classes. Why? There were no schools. Their school did not offer AP, and they didn't have teachers who taught them. That's right. Now, those 100,000 Black students will go off to college and pay more in their student in their tuition yeah. because they do not have the six to nine credits to just roll in. Right. So they're going to pay anywhere between $1,000 to $3,000 more just because they were Black. That's reparation. Or in New York City, you can suspend the kid up to 120 days. Mm -hmm. There's only 180 days in the school year. <laughs> now, when you suspend the kid, do they get a check? Lunch, mm -hmm. tutors, computers, they get nothing, but everybody gets paid. Mm -hmm. He has not been in school with 100 days. Got paid. That's that child money. Oh. We also know. That if you are a young black boy and you have two black teachers in elementary school, just two, the likelihood that you will graduate and go off to college increases anywhere between 32 and 39%. Just having two black teachers in elementary school. That's it. All the black children who have not had black teachers, they have been pushed out of school, meaning that you are impacting their learning and earning potential for the rest of their lives. High school diploma, no high school diploma. There's a quarter of a million dollars mm -hmm. of lifelong earnings in between them. And you think about all the children that have been pushed out, didn't graduate. You have changed the course of their lives financially. So it's always about dollars and cents. Well, we got dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. And so these economists calculated that just for my generation, the hip hop generation, the post civil rights generation, is $2 trillion in these six categories. And let me be very clear, it's just to start. I truly believe that we just scratched the surface. We were at my house when Chell was cooking, you know, salmon cakes for him. Like we, we, there's, I mean, think what a think tank at Harvard could come up with. Think what a think tank at Spelman and Morehouse can come up with. And so this is just the beginning. But I think we have to be thinking about education and reparations and putting that conversation together. Because those other levels are true. But I also want us to think about the wealth gap. Well, if we were to do the wealth gap right now, let's say that this country actually said, you know what, we'll give y'all. Okay, the wealth gap we'll give to. It's only about 90 to $100,000 that every black person would get if we did the wealth gap. But what I argue with the book is that reparations can't just be a check. Now, let me be clear. A check is important. Mm -hmm. I would not play a check. 
Right. But what well, reparation it is full of is about a transformation in democracy. Right. Yes. Right. It's about you atoning for harm and then ending harm. And the folks who did the harm can't become the reparation committee. So what happened? No, 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 give us your money and move. And so this is why I think education and reparation go hand in hand. And actually, I think we have more, there's not, we have so much data in education. Clear data of underfunding, clear data of racism. There is no probably other field that we have all the data to show inequality is through education. But if we will think about reparation beyond just a wealth gap of education, and think about how every industry owes black people. Could you imagine what the medical field owes black people? The medical, what they owe black people. The experiments from now to the from mm -hmm. the banking industry, what we owe, what they owe black people. Yeah. The wealth gap just scratches the surface of what is really owed to us. But if each industry would not only talk about reparations, but also atonement. And that is where we have to get as society. That's where we have to push at society. And that's what put us on the offense, not always on the defense. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we got time for questions. Yeah, we're going to take some questions. And the microphone is up here so we can hear you. I think we got time for maybe four people. So I know that's not a lot, but um, I don't know. I mean, can I use the back? Hello. 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 So I'm really trying to talk. So I'm hoping this question isn't too off the hook. I just want to see your thoughts on the Michael situation where, you know, you thought it was about it for that whole time, but it wasn't. Because I think it correlates just because, you know, high school education, you went to college, and then the NFL and so forth. Yeah, you know, I think it, you know, I start out the book as an athlete, so I think it aligns with the, it's white folks being white. I mean, it's not, I don't think, even overthinking. <laughs> right, it's white folks being white. They misled him. You know, until we can get a full account of what they made. So we want receipts. I'm sure he wants receipts. But I also think there's a beautiful story, right? Because shout out Black women. Mm -hmm. He was in that agreement for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Married the Black woman. She said, where's the receipt? <laughs> <laughs> He's not NFL, you know, he's, he's not, you know, 22 year old kid anymore. So, what prompted this? Like, what do I do? Paperwork. And so, I think the real story that's underlined here is his black wife. That's right. Who asked for receipts and receipts could not be provided. And then he started going down the mine shaft and realized what is happening. Uh, and so, that's the real story for me. That's the tea. It's his wife. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, I think the very first thing is to do away with high stakes standardized testing. Yeah. Talk about data. We got four years of data that this ain't working. 
We got 40 years of data that shows that it's causing anxiety and all types of yeah. things in our kids. And we also know that high school exit exams, like I'm from New York, New York has the raggedy thing called the Regents. It's just raggedy. Like, how do you, how are you in school for 13 years? And now here we are the last six months, you don't pass any of these tests, you don't graduate. I've been here for 13 years. <laughs> but we also know that the Regents exams and exit exams like that increases carcerality by 14 to 15%. Mm -hmm. So basically I'm not graduating and then you just throw me into the carceral system. But we also have to be able to be clear about our message. I like tests. I don't think tests are bad. I don't want high state standardized testing. I don't want an industry profiting off of my demise. Mm -hmm. I don't want an industry ensuring that these tests are not culturally relevant so I can ensure that these children fail the test so I can go ahead and proliferate jails in this country. Mm -hmm. So we have to be clear about getting rid of high state standardized testing. I think the very next thing is clear. We've seen teacher protests and strikes happening all around the country. We had a number of them last year. Teachers would like to make a living wage, right? In Oakland, you, a family of four needs to make around 52 in Oakland. Teachers make 50. We're not even making a living wage. We need state-of-the-art school. You can't walk to a school that's crumbling and want me to think I'm going to go to my highest potential. Right? We need state-of-the-art schools. We need schools that have what these other schools have. And so, I mean, those are just, we also need classrooms where it's not 30, 40 kids in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And we also need highly skilled, highly trained teachers. Mm -hmm. Right? If you want, we know up from slavery, the first thing we did was build schools. We educated our children and we did it with less. And they were and we got brilliant. Mm -hmm. We know what can be done. I would say, you know, there's a chapter in the book called White Folks Save Yourself. Mm -hmm. Leave us alone. Mm -hmm. We good. <laughs> if we have not taught y'all anything in 400 years, that we're going to be all right. Now, what you could do is remove the barriers. What you could do is pay your fare. But as far as like we need you, we are actually good. What we need is our money. What we need is our resources. So we need highly skilled teachers. We need actual schools that are not crumbling. We need to pay teachers a living wage. We need to get rid of standardized testing. And we need to have actual curriculum that actually reflects our heritage, our culture, and who we are. Because I tell people all the time, if you think anti-racism is talking about the pain and the trauma of slavery, that ain't anti-racism. And that's not my history. That's your history. Mm -hmm. My history is how we overcame. My history is how we love. My history is how we fought. My history is how we made a way out of no way. That's actually my history. So if all you're going to teach about Black folks is trauma and pain, that's not a class on anti-racism. That's a class on power and privilege. And so teach who we are. Teach our history. Teach our greatness. Because it actually will benefit you because this is your history too. Because you don't have a country without us. Just a few things. <laughs> Those cynical convention hearings would be lit. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, you mentioned there's the teaching force is like 88% white, and that to me seems like a big problem. I don't know if you view that as a problem and how to kind of shift away from that other than some teachers will maybe use them not to teach. Uh, if you can connect your curriculum to the people that you teach, right? But I, um, anyhow, I just wondered about that. Yeah, I think that's a great question because 88% of teachers are white and it's not, it's not changing anytime soon. So what do we do? So the best example I can give you is last month in Florida. Last month in Florida, you had a awarded principal who was newly minted principal, comes highly regarded who thought it was a great idea to take all the students who didn't do so well on their standardized tests, mm -hmm. to put them in an assembly room yeah. and tell them that if they increase their test scores, they would get chicken and gift cards. Mm -hmm. And if they don't increase their test scores, they're going to end up dead or in jail. Yeah. Now, that was not 1954. That was last month in Florida. Mm -hmm. Now, do I think that white teachers wake up in the morning and say to themselves, why well, cannot wait to terrorize the black child? No. Mm -hmm. I think white teachers are waking up trying to do their best, but they, all, they have not swept outside their own front door. Mm -hmm. They have not done the work. Mm -hmm. 
They don't know who they're teaching. Those, those principals and that teacher really thought this was a good idea. Had a PowerPoint presentation. about black people. If you hold on to these stereotypes and the anti-blackness of it, you will do harm. Because those myths and those stereotypes become policy. They become classroom decisions. They become how you dictate and run your classroom. So yes, I think we need teachers. I think we need all teachers. But if you won't do harm, then we don't need you. If you don't understand the brilliance of blackness that you have in front of you, then we don't need you. Because you are going to do harm. And let me be very clear. There's no black folks who do harm. No, There's no black teachers. I'm like, we push you to the side. No, no. But we do have data that says two things. Number one, that HBCUs are doing an incredible job preparing the workforce for black folks. And we also know that all students benefit from a diversity of teachers. All students. And so I think what white teachers have to do is have to understand why are you here? Oof. Who told you that you had the right to teach our children? And if you understand that, then you start using the term. As my grandmother would say, you start speaking outside your own mother. And so what I'm trying to tell white teachers is listen, it's not about you being in the classroom with us. It's about how you live your life. If the work that you're doing for justice is from nine to five, we good. Because the real work is where do you do? Hello. Where do you shop? Hello. Where do you spend your money? What books come into your home? What TV shows do your children watch? When somebody says something terrible about black folks in your home, do you check it? Do you say anything about them? Because then you walk into the classroom different because that's actually how you live your life. Come on, come on. If you think the work is just doing it, you know, because you ain't here with us. And I want to be very clear, you because of us. You live in the city, but you take your money out to the store. You can't go to great colleges off the money that we provide. That's our money. That's black folks' money. You got white folks teaching at an all black school because of us. People do not see us and not see our value. You are going to do harm in the classroom. So for me, it's not just about the color of your skin. I tell black people all the time, that might get you in the door for a little bit, but once the kids realize you whack too, you out. You, you, you might have a full more day than that might be. You out too. We know it's about relationships. We know it's about intent and how you see us and how you talk about us and how you look at us and how you look at my mama when she comes through the door. Yeah. Kids are watching all of that. All of it they watch. How you correct my English, all of it they watch. And so all of those things are important, but I do think white teachers have to understand, how did you get here? You got here because they gutted us. And why are you here? And if you can't answer why you're here rather than just to be a teacher, we need more than that. Come on. We need more than that, bro. Come on. Because the damage is damaging. Mm -hmm. Damn. Um, I wanted to say I love how you talked about the abolition teacher network and the fact that they can promote you and they can elevate you and they can use your words to be able to fund their co up and two weeks later go about tearing you down that way. And then you think about being black or brown educator and just being in a system where, um, like Mr. Paul, we can watch our changes be gentrified. And then you think of combination of two things. How do we, as black and brown educators, um, that want to be more than survive and feel the back end of the watch people walk out the door, but also be in front of the dream in the form of the dream? How do we, as black educators, want to be more than survive and feel the education while we watch our kids walk out the door, while also watching our dreams get punished through the gentrifying of our genius? The low rate and low cost of the parents to do our jobs, but simply by silencing our ideas because we're going to get the same. Come on. Let's put y'all ready, teacher. Come on. Hello. <laughs> Hello. 
So thank you for that question. It is so good to see you. I think the first thing that Black educators have to do is let go of the ego. I'm going to tell you why. It's not that many of us. And I have been in the room, and it's just me and some white folks. And the first, when you try to open your mouth, they can make it seem like you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and so you yes, you are not building community, not doing what you need to do for your students because they got that. I need more. I need more. We got need more people. How we get more of us to the door? That's first and foremost. Because you cannot get sucked into that. Come on. Second thing is we have to be saying, what else are y'all going to do? I've seen black women on 13 committees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just running us wild. So if you have a black educator, the first thing you have to do is let go of your ego. Oh. Second thing you have to do is ask all these folks, can you help me? Where, where, can, can you help me? Don't cheer me on, help me. Come on. Because this is how we get punished. Doing all the work and all the labor constantly. And you know, Mr. So oh, Cliff is just amazing. He's doing this, he's doing that. And they will actually be talking about how good you're doing. While you're running, we're done. And I've seen it time and time again that the young, ready to go teacher, and they just where him or her now. Next is stop giving the new teacher the saltiest kid. Oh. And so I think it's number one, black teachers need therapy. We need healing. We need to be very clear about why we're there. And most importantly, we need to be building community. Come on. We need to have our own time and our own conversations. We need to tell white teachers, this is not for you right now. We, we need our time. Because what racism will do is make you think you're crazy. Ooh. Racism will have you questioning everything you've ever done. And it's not until you're with other black folks, other folks of color, you're like, Right. Like, right. Bam! But too often when they're in our spaces, we can't heal properly because we are trying to not say what we know we need to say because they're in our spaces. Um, so that's why we need our own space, our own time to process, to understand, and then get with the parents. That's their children. That's their children. Get with the parents. Ask them what make what makes your child special. Now I'm gonna be um. It's it's just important. Now there's a seasoned teacher in this room who Asa Hiller called a master teacher, and it is my child's teacher. Yes. And the first thing that she did was try to find out what my child what made my child special. Hmm. What is she like? What was she into? And then used it to bring a math score up from to an A. <laughs> 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 but was there every step of the way? I will always thank you. That's what it's about. But you ask that question for the audience. And I know what you're doing. Kill it. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you so much for your question. I think it's time to take us to the audience and see you. Thank you. Um, this, this question is connected to the Marvin session of how to steal teachers and other uh, ways. 
Uh, I think that point has been made several times tonight. Um, and we know there's several fields of performance based. We look at doctors, lawyers, different things like that, respectively, fields that are performance based that they are compensated for their performance. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know what ideas you might have for recognizing teachers for some of that, the intangibles we talk about through abolitionist teaching, uh, such as strength, union, uh, solidarity, um, innovation, uh, different things, different approaches that we know to be excellent teaching, but we have difficulty to name. So we know that uh, currently, uh, what performance there is of teaching is simply based on standardized tests, which we know to be punitive and draconian in nature. So how do we push back against that to reward some of the other contaminants? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I've always believed that you shouldn't be a teacher until the community says you should be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I've always believed that auntie should say you ready. <laughs> not some test, not the gaze, not it. Um, NETP, whatever the initials they got, that we should have a say, that the community should be evaluating you. Not just parents, the community should be evaluating you. Old heads should be evaluating you. Like, how are you translating this not only to your students, but to your community? Because at the end of the day, as an educator, your job is to serve. You are there to serve the public. Yeah. And so the public should have a say. Now, it should be our public, not just anybody public. But I think at the end of the day, we have to try to understand if this is actually public education and the public good, then how does the public have a say in what their children learn, how their children learn, and who gets to teach their children? And right now, you know, it, it, it would be amazing if the right actually cared about education to have an honest conversation about it. Like who gets to sit up in front of children? Right. Who gets to be a teacher in this country? It's very shaky state to state. Right now, in some states, they're saying you need a high school diploma to be a teacher. During the pandemic, they let police in full uniform teach our children. And so when you think about those intangibles, I think they should come from the community. I think they should be pushed from the community. But I also think we have to ask schools of education to do a better job. Yeah. Absolutely. Schools of education are not doing the job that we think they are doing. Too often, you can go through your whole four years of college and not take one African American studies class. Uh -huh. And then you call me relevant. Because you took a class on, did you, how are you going to degree in justice? We really not, we're really giving our degrees in justice. You can't, you can't get a degree in justice. You have not worked in any community. Nobody knows you, but you got a degree in justice. That makes no sense. We also have to look at all of these online institutions and how they have taken so much money from Black people. Mm. And so when we, the question that you're asking, I think it's really, for me, it's about how do we have an education system, a teacher pipeline that is actually doing the work that the community would want them to do, not just what they think is best for our children. And a baseline, the baseline, right, would be in a state like Georgia, right, where a teacher walks in this walks in making eighty thousand dollars, right? If you want me to take an eight dollar, if you want me to get eighty thousand dollars worth of debt, I should at least make eighty, right? Or here we go with Uncle Joe, right? Forgive his student loan, right? We should not, you should not have all this debt to be a public servant. Right? That doesn't make sense. And so we're going to get a diverse teaching force. I'm not going to be a church person to go to college in my family and then take on $80,000 worth of debt to make $40,000 a year. That, the math ain't math. So if you look at the teaching profession and you see right now, you know, we're going to be with the baby boomers retiring, we're going to be in dire need in a very short time. And there's two things happening right now. Number one, that's what they want. And number two, we have nobody at the table right now with any real solutions and not putting real money into creating another teaching force. If this was the medical field, this was another field, we would have strong initiatives. But this country somehow believes it could be a thriving democracy without public education. Thank you. Give it up one more time for Dr. Ann. 
But I just want to say everybody who bought a book, tweeted about a book, talked about the book, you know, I 